Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar. I'm Lori Smetenka, the Executive Director of the National Consumer Voice for Quality Long-Term Care, and you are listening today to our webinar, Balancing Privacy and Protection, Surveillance Cameras in Nursing Home Residence Rooms. We are delighted to um, speak with you today, and uh, we are doing today's webinar in partnership with the National Center on Elder Abuse, so I'm going to give you a, a few logistical um, pieces of information about the webinar, and then we'll um, move into um, hearing from uh, Julie Shane, who's the Deputy Director of the National Center on Elder Abuse, and then get started with our presentation for today. But we do have um, Julie Shane, who's joining us, um, as well as Bill Whited, who is the state's long-term care ombudsman from the great state of Oklahoma, and we're delighted to have both of them with us today. Um, so we, um, a few, let's see, a few webinar logistics. First of all, as you heard, all lines um, will be muted during the presentations as part of the webinar. You can post questions using the chat feature on your webinar control panel. That's um, in the bottom, uh, one of the bottom um, fields um, in your control panel is a slide for questions, and you can click on that and type in your questions, and we will be monitoring those throughout the webinar, and as time permits, towards the end, we will um, get to as many of them as we can. Um, as you heard at the beginning, um, this webinar is being recorded, and the recording will be um, available and emailed out to you all the link, as well as posted on the Consumer Voice website and the um, National Center on Elder Abuse, I'm sure we'll share that as well. And also in the handout section on your control panel, you can access a copy of today's PowerPoint and the fact sheet that has been prepared on this topic for today. So for those of you um, who may not be familiar with our organization, the National Consumer Voice for Quality Long-Term Care is a national not-for-profit organization in Washington, D.C., and we advocate um, for people that are receiving care and services at home, in assisted living, and in nursing homes. We operate the National Long-Term Care Ombudsman Resource Center as part of our work, and we also um, operate a clearinghouse of information and resources for families, consumers, advocates, citizen advocates, ombudsmen, and others who are interested in quality care and quality of life in long-term care. We also provide technical assistance and support for state advocacy regarding long-term care services and supports and have a national action network. Um, we're delighted to have you be, um, here with us today, and I would like to introduce Julie Shane, um, the Deputy Director of the National Center on Elder Abuse, who will tell you a few words about that program. Julie? Thank you so much, Lori. Uh, for those of you who aren't acquainted with the National Center on Elder Abuse, we're one of the 27 resource centers that are funded by the Administration on Community Living through a grant that's given to the Keck School of Medicine at USC. And if you are not part of our listserv and our other uh, community, uh, we want to make sure that you know about us and there'll be a slide at the very end of the presentation that will give you all the contact information you need to, uh, to meet up with us and to get all the information you might uh, desire. Um, things that we provide are, of course, some educational resources. We don't want you to have to reinvent anything. There are many great uh, toolkits and fact sheets that we want you to use and replicate and um, brand if you need to um, so that you can go out and disseminate the information. And we have a very robust uh, training curricula, which we also have a separate uh, website that just houses training materials. We do uh, all the up-to-date research compilation and we are working with our partners all the time to keep up with what is new and trending in the field of elder abuse. And if you have innovative models and things that you would like to share, we definitely want to get that out to the public. So uh, today we're so pleased to be working with uh, Consumer Voice. They're a, a fantastic partner. And when we were talking about what are the things that the public is very interested in and that we need to build upon, this topic is one that uh, came up definitely at the top of the list. And we were concerned about how it's received and kind of the emotional aspect of it. 
But I can't say enough for what the Consumer Voice team has put together today with the help of Bill um, from the Oklahoma Agency. We are just um, thrilled to be a part of this and look forward to your comments and your questions at the end of the presentation. So, Lori, back to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Julie. So we'll get into the program for today. Um, why electronic monitoring? As Julie had mentioned, um, as we were talking about a topic that we wanted to work on together, um, this is one that actually was at um, near the top of both of our lists, which um, was pretty funny when we came together and started um, talking about different topics. And um, why it's interesting to me particularly is because um, it's a cyclical issue for us in the sense that um, we have started we talking about this uh, many, many years ago um, <clears throat> through the advocacy that we do here at Consumer Voice. I remember back in the 90s um, when our membership passed a resolution on this issue around um, using um, surveillance cameras or granny cams, as they're sometimes called in long-term care facilities, particularly in residence rooms. And um, the discussion and debate that would exist around this topic at that time. And every couple years, the topic comes up again, um, but in those um, in between times, we don't hear much about it. Um, but uh, we we do know that it's at the top of many people's minds, and it usually comes to light again after seeing um, different media stories or events um, that will happen and bring to light different abuses that are taking place in long-term care facilities. Um, you'll see on the slide in front of you um, just two examples from the past couple of years. Um, most recently, um, the sexual abuse story from CNN that came out this past summer. And um, the electronic monitoring debate and discussion generally um, heats up again when we see these different stories um, that come to light through the media. And clearly, um, people are interested in electronic monitoring, surveillance cameras, audio monitoring, um, when there are concerns about poor care um, of their loved one in a nursing home, if there are um, unexplained injuries, um, if the resident is um, unable to verbally communicate any concerns or has severe dementia and is unable to tell their family what is going on in the facility, we find that those family members are often most more interested in, um, in electronic surveillance. Um, and also if there is lack of response to expressed concerns um, from uh, the facilities if they have been raised. Um, what we find is that <clears throat> families um, who have concerns about the care that their loved one is receiving or even about um, possible abuse or neglect that's happening, as a result, will sometimes um, turn to the use of these electronic monitoring devices as a means of trying to figure out what exactly is going on with the resident in the facility. <clears throat> As I mentioned, um, both audio and video recording devices are being used in long-term care facilities. Um, sometimes people pick one or the other. Sometimes people are picking both. Um, and the most common thing that we see and hear about are cameras or recording devices being placed in a residence room or in part of their room to capture what is taking place um, there in the facility. <clears throat> I want to acknowledge that um, some nursing homes do uh, operate cameras in the public areas of the long-term care facilities, and that's not what we're talking about today. We're more talking about the surveillance in um, residents' individual rooms, um, and sometimes what we also see is that they're out in the open. Um, the cameras are recording devices, and sometimes they are hidden um, in some sort of um, in some sort of um, hiding device um, or behind something so that um, folks don't know that the recording is taking place. So what is it that um, people are trying to get at with the recording devices? Well, certainly we know that they capture everything that's happening in that residence room, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Certainly what we would hope that we would see um, if we have recording devices in a residence room is that we're gonna see great things happening, good care being provided, um, persons being treated with dignity and respect, tenderness, um, uh, residents' rights being respected. Unfortunately, that is not 
um, always what's shown. And um, too often uh, what it does find is that there is rough handling, whether it be intentional or not. Um, and actually, um, I was talking with someone just the other day about um, rough handling that was taking place as part of care where the um, caregivers were not intending to um, abuse or, or um, be aggressive with the resident, but that's the manner in which they were working with that person and it was concerning for the residents. But it, um, these recording devices also show things like bullying, they show things like um, neglect, that um, is care that is not being provided to the individuals. There are long lapses between care that needs to be provided. And unfortunately, it also shows abusive situations that are happening. <clears throat> As our staff was doing research on these issues um, and we're reading examples from um, information available from states and from news reports, we actually found examples of all of these things on the slide here. We found examples of good care being provided um, where it actually was comforting to the, the family member to see that their loved one had been cared for so well um, at the end of that person's life. We um, saw care being inappropriately given that was not necessarily mistreatment in the form of abuse, but um, it was again back to that rough handling where the aides were quick um, in, and tr trying to get their tasks done and not really paying attention to how, um, how rough they may have been with the care that they were being um, providing, and certainly that needed to be addressed um, by the facility. Um, we've, they also show lack of competent care being provided where um, folks may not be doing things correctly and uh, that needs to be addressed and corrected. And then, as I mentioned, um, they also showed situations of abuse. Um, unfortunately, um, another area where um, this has come up is in um, the use of social media, where um, you've probably seen a number of articles over the past um, couple of years where there have been recordings by staff um, of residents in compromising or undignified positions um, that have been posted as well. And um, that falls into um, the use of electronic and monitoring in these situations also. So one of the things that we wanted to highlight today was um, the focus on um, the residents' rights of dignity, respect, and privacy, and um, how that is really core to the care that needs to be provided to long-term care facility residents. And as we know, all residents in nursing homes have the right to quality care. What that means is that it's individualized care designed to meet the needs of that particular person. Each resident has that right, um, and that promotes dignity, choice, and self-determination in all aspects of their life and their care, that they actually can direct um, and determine um, what that means for themselves um, and that they should be treated that way by other individuals, whether it be staff, other residents, or family, friends, or other visitors to the facility. Um, and they also have the right to um, assure that they have the highest practicable well-being for each person in the facility and, and that must be provided by the facility as well. All residents have the same rights that you or I do. Um, just because they're living in a nursing home does not mean that they have um, that they have any less rights, and that often needs to be remembered by people who who talk about the core scope of residents' rights that we talk about in regulation. But that doesn't mean that there um, are less rights that those individuals have rights to. We do focus on um, the aspects that are in regulation to really highlight the fact that these individuals have the right to be protected from mistreatment, including abuse, neglect, and exploitation, and that they are entitled to quality individualized care. And we talk about it because there are responsibilities, certainly, of the facility to make sure that the residents are free from abuse and neglect. As mentioned above, the residents also have the ability or right to make choices um, regarding all aspects of their care, and that fits into the rights um, that they have as well. So certainly, as we are living in our own homes and community settings and outside of long-term care facilities, we can choose um, whether to use surveillance devices, for example, or um, what aspects of that care need to be incorporated into our daily lives, and that pertains to residents as well. 
we wanted to focus on the aspects of dignity and respect that need to be taken into consideration as um, a resident or family member is thinking about using an electronic device in a resident's room. Um, this is a paramount issue that needs to be addressed before any type of electronic device is, um, is put into operation. Certainly, um, a resident has the right to dignity and respect in interactions with anyone else inside or outside of the facility. And as we talk about that, we mean that they're spoken to kindly and treated respectfully, um, that they're not being subjected to um, uh, compromised or undignified recordings or photos that are being shared on social media without their consent, that they're not being uh, mishandled or roughly handled when care is being provided. Um, that proper guidelines are being followed and that they're treated with dignity and like human beings with kindness and respect. So certainly that is um, a really important aspect that needs to be um, taken into account and needs to be thought through um, before one decides whether or not a surveillance device or electronic um, monitoring or recording device is um, incorporated into a residence room. Privacy is another area that's paramount when thinking about this issue. Um, certainly, um, as you think about what privacy means to you um, and what invasions of that privacy mean to you, um, there are certain commonalities across all of us. Um, we want privacy in our own personal space, in our private rooms, um, during personal care, um, when we're being assisted with bathing or dressing or toileting, um, we need to think about when these electronic devices are going to be put into effect and incorporated um, and, and recording. Um, and would we want recordings to be taking place during that provision of such very personal care um, that's being provided to us? Also, privacy and communications. When we're thinking about audio recordings, they will pick up communications between residents certainly, and the staff that are being provided there, but also with others who are coming in to visit with them, whether it be family or friends, clergy, doctors, ombudsmen, anyone else. And so um, how the use of these recording devices will impact the dignity and the quality um, uh, of care that they receive and also um, the privacy of those individuals is paramount and needs to be taken into consideration. Um, I wanted to mention that um, just last year, CMS, in response to um, one of the um, uh, news articles that had come out around um, resident images um, being shown on social media that really um, looked at uh, mental abuse and, and it was um, really undignified um, videos being shared of residents without their certainly without their consent. CMS issued a survey and certification memo reinforcing a resident's right to privacy, not only of their personal space, but also in terms of their accommodations and personal care in the facility. And in that memo, CMS again reinforced the need to obtain consent from the resident or their designated representative um, if any type of recording device were going to be um, used around a resident. Um, even if it's uh, just, you know, uh, recording a resident talking that's going to be used in an ad or um, during an open public um, uh, event that's taking place with the facility, they should not be sharing um, those images of the resident without their consent. So as, um, as the use of electronic devices have um, occurred, over time and in states. Um, states have actually taken some steps to address the use of these cameras. Um, there have been um, a handful of them that actually have passed laws um, or guidelines that need to be taken into consideration prior to the use of these devices. Actually, there are more states that have um, had this discussion and debate um, that have not actually passed laws or guidelines, but have had the discussion. Um, but these states listed here, Illinois, New Mexico, Texas, and Washington, and Oklahoma, um, who we'll hear from in just a minute, have um, actually passed laws um, around these issues. And Maryland did not pass a law, but um, did have a debate and passed some guidelines that need to be taken into, uh, into account. Each of the laws or guidelines address 
really a complementary set of issues that you'll see listed out on the slide in front of you. They all address in some form or capacity the issue of consent um, in terms of using the device and who can provide that consent. Um, they address notice requirements, who needs to be notified um, and where that notice needs to take place. The assumption of costs of the recording device, including installation, operation, and um, uh, removal of the device. Penalties for obstruction or tampering um, with the device, access to the recordings, and um, use of the recordings um, or the information that is gathered. Um, I will say that the, um, the state laws, while they all address um, similar issues, don't necessarily address them in the same way. And so it would be important to um, look at and review what the states are requiring as part of these, um, these laws prior to using any type of recording device in a facility. There are a couple other states that have also um, looked at this issue and um, there are some different ways that they address it. So for example, in New Jersey, um, the Office of Attorney General has a program called Safe Care Cam, where um, the Attorney General's office will actually loan camera equipment to families for use in long-term care facilities. It's a program that was started about a year ago um, and actually was initially being used in the home care setting, but just earlier this year, the um, Office of Attorney General in New Jersey expanded um, the Safe Cam program to um, nursing homes. And so uh, more information about it uh, can be obtained on our website and through the Office of Attorney General's website. Um, but it is an opportunity for families that have concerns about the care that their loved one is receiving in a nursing home to contact the Office of Attorney General, ask them for um, use of their cameras and it will be provided to them for free on a limited basis for a certain number of days where they can be installed um, and then um, they would work with the Attorney General's office if there needed to be additional follow-up. But um, that's a different way that a state is addressing the issue. And then also in the state of Ohio, um, the Office of Attorney General has um, worked through its Medicaid Fraud Control Unit to um, install cameras in under certain circumstances. If there are concerns about poor care, they will work with residents and family members um, in some cases to install a camera in a facility to um, get a sense of uh, what the concerns are and what's happening in that um, particular residence room and, and in the care that's being provided to that person. Um, and then they will make a determination as to whether that fits into further charges needed, needing to be brought by the Medicaid fraud control unit. Um, so um, these two states have not passed separate laws for um, individuals, residents, and family members to install their own cameras as some of the other states that we've mentioned, Illinois, um, uh, Oklahoma, um, some of the others have, um, but these are two other ways that surveillance cameras and recording devices are being used in long-term care facilities. So let's now um, turn over to Bill Whited, the state ombudsman from Oklahoma, who's gonna talk about Oklahoma's law and um, some of the benefits, challenges, and effects that he has seen um, in response to the passage of this law in his state. So Bill, let me turn it over to you. Thank you, Lori. I appreciate the, the headline. Before we get into the main slides, I want to uh, give everybody a little bit of a background on Oklahoma's electronic monitoring law. The original bill that was filed to make electronic monitoring legal in the state of Oklahoma, um, or to at least fortify it in state statute, was something that the Oklahoma Office of the State Long-Term Care Ombudsman originally opposed. The original language in the bill uh, required two cameras in each resident room and also audio recordings in all other care areas, including restrooms, shower rooms, sauna rooms, things of that nature. And it was going to be controlled by, the cameras were going to be controlled by the facilities, and then the electronic recording submitted to the Oklahoma State Department of Health, which is the licensing agency here in Oklahoma, and create a database of all of those. So 
so the, the state ombudsman at the time, Mr. Hauser, my predecessor, um, and I were both very concerned about that type of approach to using electronic monitoring because it took out the ability of the resident to truly have much of a say in how or when any electronic monitoring would occur. So we actively opposed the original language in the bill and, and worked with legislators to come up with what we have today, which I personally believe is a um, much uh, appreciated and needed avenue to offer some degree of comfort to the residents and their families that are residing in long-term care facilities. Now, with that being said, as uh, Lori had alluded to earlier, if you become familiar with one electronic monitoring law for one state, then you're only familiar with one. Every state is a little bit different that has these laws, so don't ever assume that um, Texas will be the same as Oklahoma or Illinois will be the same as Oklahoma. So in my comments today, it will be specific to Oklahoma, and, and please understand that. Next slide, please, Lori. Okay, the Oklahoma Nursing Home Care Act is where Oklahoma state law is fortified in the governance of long-term care facilities. And you will see that the statute that regards electronic monitoring is 63-1-1953.1. That statute's been in place for about four years now here in the state of Oklahoma. And it says that authorized electronic screen means the placement of electronic monitoring devices in the common areas or room of a resident of a nursing facility and the tapes or recordings from such devices pursuant to the provision of this act. It means that a video surveillance camera installed in the common areas or audio devices installed in the resident's room and that they can be desired to acquire communications or other sounds coming from the room. So, not only can you record the video, you also get to record the audio as well. Uh, next, please. Okay, so there are some protections built into our statute in regards to using electronic monitoring here. First and foremost, a resident and or their family must provide written notice to the facility. They, the facility cannot refuse admittance or discharge because a family wishes to use such device and a facility shall post near its main interest that those types of devices may be in use. It has also created a requirement that tampering with or hampering the camera is actually a crime and can be punishable here in the state. Um, I believe it's a misdemeanor. And there are provisions in the statute that make it to where it's illegal to intercept the communications or images um, without consent of the facility if that has to do with the common area or the resident if it's in a residence room. And one of the key things that we included in our statute here in Oklahoma is that recordings can be admitted into evidence in both civil and criminal proceedings. And this is really important and part of the back story as to why that is in there. Here in Oklahoma, when this statute uh, was being pursued, there really was not a whole lot of opposition from the long-term care industry. And, and there's what I believe to be one main reason, two main reasons behind that. First of all, nobody wants to come out on record and say, oh, I'm against trying to prevent abuse or improve quality of care. So they, they kind of stay quiet on that note too. But right before this bill was filed, there was a granny cam, for lack of a better term, being used in a long-term care facility where the aides that were providing care to the residents were caught tormenting the resident and literally shoving gloves, latex gloves, into the resident's mouth. And our district attorney here in Oklahoma County actually used that video recording to prosecute um, those individuals that had perpetrated that crime. So that had just came out in the media and, and really helped us have some degree of uh, ability to get this statute passed through in the way that we did. Next slide, please. 
Okay, so what powers or limitations are there for the resident and or their representative? Of course, you must obtain written consent from a roommate or their legal representative if there is one. Now keep in mind, of course, um, the, the way this works here in Oklahoma is that if the resident is capable and able of providing that consent, then they're the one who gets to do that. They only go to the legal representative if that resident does not have the ability to provide informed consent or has been deemed incompetent by a court of law here in the state of Oklahoma. A roommate can place limitations on what they can be allowed to do. They can say, I don't want the camera pointed at my room, or I don't want audio recording being used, or, or whatever the uh, limitation that they wish to, to give. Or they may outright um, deny the use of such camera. Now, if if they absolutely deny it, then of course there are some provisions in the statute that the facility must help the resident find the first available room um, in which they would be able to use the camera. Once a camera is going to be used or some other form of electronic monitoring device, keep in mind Oklahoma statute's not specific about cameras. It says electronic monitoring. So it can be audio, it can be camera, it can be video, it can be digital. There, it really leaves it open for a wide use of uh, devices. So once that has been determined that yes, they are going to place a camera, they've gotten consent from the resident's roommate, they must provide written notice to the facility that they are going to use electronic monitoring. And there's a specific form that they have to fill out and they provide that to the facility. It's not a situation of the facility being able to say yes or no to that electronic monitoring though. Is what it is, is it's, hey, we're going to do this. And it's just giving the facility a heads up that they are going to do it. Now, all the associated costs with using such devices are belonging to the resident or the family, the legal representative, the facility bears no responsibility or cost whatsoever in the use or maintenance of those devices. Now, another provision of our statute states that a resident may post upon the entrance to their room on their door or outside of their door um, that electronic monitoring devices may be in use. It's not a requirement that they do that upon entering their room, but it is an option for them to do that. And and I, I think this may have been an unintended consequences in the beginning, but this is actually has played in the benefit of, of some families and residents. Many individuals that I have talked to have filled out the forms, gotten the consent, and actually informed the facility that they are going to be placing a camera, and they'll post their sign on their door outside of their room saying that the camera is in use, but they never actually place a camera. So it's kind of like those fake uh, signs that people put in their front yards that say, my house is under video surveillance. It's the same type of premise. It gives them some sense of security to make maybe somebody who would be an intended abuser think twice about going into the room and um, perpetrating any such uh, event on that resident. Next slide, please. Okay, so what's the outcome of the electronic monitoring law here in Oklahoma? Um, I believe it has worked as a deterrence in some instances, keeping uh, people aware that they're potentially being watched at any given moment in a facility, uh, makes them think twice about perpetrating some kind of crime against them. It also has provided some irrefutable evidence of abuse and neglect in some situations where those videos have come to light, you have uh, the, the event captured on, on tape, and, and you're able to use that in a court of law to you know, either prosecute somebody or take civil action against somebody. It's created some degree of a sense of safety and empowerment for residents and families. As Lori had mentioned earlier, many times the camera doesn't come into play until there's questions as to where did these injuries come from? You know, is neglect occurring? And, and they're trying to explain some event that they're concerned about. And, and that's when many people place the cameras. Now, there are some other areas that you have to be aware of that the use of cameras can create. Of course, Lori alluded to privacy concerns earlier. There, there are some privacy concerns, and 
the the one thing that when you're considering the use of electronic monitoring that I when I always talk to the families that, that call my office and ask me about this, I always make sure that they understand that they must include the resident in this process and they must get the residents buy in before they ever try to play some kind of camera. Because I have had residents tell my ombudsman that if they place a camera in my room, I will never step foot in there again. I don't want that type of invasion of my privacy. And so by placing a camera, you could actually exacerbate a resident's um, own care concerns, their paranoia at times. If, if residents are, are living with a mental illness that has a paranoia side effect of it, um, you know, individuals may be living with paranoid schizophrenia or things of that nature, just the very presence of a camera can actually exacerbate their condition. So those things have to be taken into consideration. There's also that competing interest of the residents, their representatives, and the facility. Family members may want one thing, a resident may want another thing, and the facility may want something entirely different. So at times there is overt obstruction. And when I'm talking about overt obstruction is what I'm referring to is the resident and or their legal representatives have done the footwork, they've taken the time to sit down with the roommate or their legal representative, they've gotten the consent forms filled out, they've turned them in, and then once they give that to the facility, the facility administrator goes down, they sit down and they talk with their roommate, and they explain what this means, and by the time they're done talking to the roommate, all of a sudden the roommate withdraws the uh, consent to use that camera or that audio recording device. So those types of things do happen here in Oklahoma. We hear about them frequently. And one thing to know is that statistically here in Oklahoma, the number of substantiated abuse and neglect changes remain relatively unchanged. Um, since the passage of this statute, I don't think it has diminished the amount of abuse that we see in long-term care facilities, nor has it exacerbated the amount of abuse. It's a tool that can be used to help families and residents feel more safe, more secure, and to catch somebody in the act if they are doing something inappropriately, and also to help identify when somebody is doing a good job. And it's always important to, to have that sense of security and feeling that you know that uh, your loved one is being appropriately taken care of. Next slide. On this slide, I have given you guys the links to the Oklahoma Nursing Home Care Act. Um, when you click on that link, it's gonna take you to a PDF file of Oklahoma's uh, Nursing Home Care Act. And if you want to find the specific section that is dealing with electronic monitoring, I'll give you a hint here, scroll all the way to the bottom of the document. The last uh, four or five sections are the sections that deal with electronic monitoring. I've also given you links to the consent uh, form that the roommate needs to fill out in the event that they are going to use electronic monitoring or consent to electronic monitoring, and then the notice to facility form. These forms were all developed by our licensing agency, the Oklahoma State Department of Health, and as such, uh, all of these links will take you to their website. Next slide. Okay, I think we're to the end. This is my contact information. If anybody wants to reach out to me via email or telephone, feel free to do so. And I, I'm open for questions and discussion if Lori's ready to go to that area. Great. Thanks so much, Bill. Appreciate you covering the, the content of, of the law and um, some of the background was really helpful. And also the, um, the considerations were really helpful to think about. And as we were pulling together um, the information um, that we have put into the fact sheet and also when thinking about how to approach this webinar, um, we did decide not to do side-by-side -side comparisons of, of all of the different state laws um, because we, we thought it would be more useful to um, talk about some of the considerations that need to be um, taken into account should, um, should you, you um, be interested in 
using an electronic monitoring device or whether your state is considering um, having the debate or discussion around passing some legislation or other mechanism to address this issue in your state. And so um, we um, are going to be focusing on the considerations um, in this next part, and then we'll turn to questions. But um, the information from the different states that have already passed um, legislation or guidelines on this issue is available on the Consumer Voice website. We've started a web page on, on this topic under our issues page um, under the section on abuse and um, all of that information can be obtained there. So um, as we are thinking through um, some of the considerations, whether it's a family member or a resident um, who's thinking about installing um, uh, some sort of electronic monitoring device or whether um, there is a state that is thinking through um, what needs to be um, considered before um, passing legislation or what needs to be contained in legislation or guidelines. Um, the first thing we just wanted to really um, iterate is that it's important to have good legal advice before um, you take any action. Um, even if your state does have um, a law or guidelines, um, it just um, is, I think, a safety measure to talk to an attorney about your rights and responsibilities with respect to installing um, any sort of electronic monitoring device, what other things need to be thought about before you do that, um, and making sure that you do understand um, whether there are any um, requirements in your own state about that as well. Um, because as we mentioned, there are now five states that have passed laws. There are another handful that have considered them, and um, one state that's um, that has adopted some guidelines around this issue. And so um, they are really important to make sure that you understand the ins and outs and the nuances of the different state laws, because as um, we've mentioned before, and as Bill has mentioned, when you've seen um, one state's laws, you've really just seen that one. They, they do adopt similar topics, as we've mentioned, and they address the issues, but um, as states do, um, many of them take different tacks. Um, when they are passing laws. And so um, what we have also um, read and, and found in our research is that failure to comply with aspects of your state law has some consequences. Um, so um, if you don't use specific forms that are required or if you don't provide the notification requirements, um, there can be limits to how you can use the information um, that's been obtained on recordings um, in Oklahoma. There is a provision, as Bill said, for um, the, the recordings to be available um, if litigation occurs. But if you don't comply with the requirements of the, of the law, you put that at risk. Um, and that might not be available to you. Um, if you don't obtain consent from your roommate or legal representative, um, that might have other, other consequences. So certainly it's important to make sure that you understand what the requirements are um, and uh, need to make sure that those are being followed. If your state does not have a law or guideline, it's um, even more critical to get legal advice with respect to what your rights and responsibilities are. Um, and certainly, um, residents and families um, and the attorneys that might be advising them should consider elements of laws that might have been passed in other states um, and certainly um, states that might be thinking about having this discussion should um, be thinking about um, some of the considerations and can get the information from other states about what they have um, already um, decided to include in their legislation but it's important to make sure that you have good advice before taking any action. Another consideration um, before um, installing any equipment is um, really what type of equipment um, do you want to install? And I, I guess um, the thing to be thinking about is what are you really wanting to get from installing this, these devices in, um, in an individual's rooms? What are you seeking to learn from the recording um, what issues are you concerned about? And that might really um, help you decide whether you want um, a camera in the room or audio recording. Um, certainly um, the video is um, able to be much more focused um, in terms of the, the screenshots that are being provided. Audio has a much broader scope. Um, there may be unintended 
recordings from other parts of the room or the hallway or the bathroom or whatever it is. So those things need to really be taken into account as um, you're considering what type of recording is going to be included. Um, our research also was showing that you need to also understand and get advice around wiretapping laws if you have um, audio recording devices and whether they apply in your specific situation or not um, because there are some limitations on audio recording of individuals from whom you do not have consent to record. So um, that really needs to be considered as well. Um, a third consideration is whether um, the facility has its own policies around uh, the use of electronic monitoring devices um, in the facility itself or in residence rooms. Certainly, um, residents and family members and their um, advocates and legal counsel need to be aware of what those policies are. Um, the, the key, again, is following whatever your state law or guidelines are around this issue. Um, because certainly, you know, we can um, anticipate that facilities might have um, more strict um, uh, provisions within their policies in terms of whether or not they would like to like you to be using recording devices. Um, and but um, certainly, I think that's why it's also important to get legal advice to understand what your rights and responsibilities are, particularly if they are in conflict with what um, facility policies are. Um, understanding your own rights and responsibilities is an important provision here. Um, as uh, our organization has discussed this issue over the years, um, we really have come down on the side of um, making sure that the resident is the one who consents or makes the final decision about whether or not an electronic monitoring device um, should be available um, in their rooms and should be available to them as a tool, as Bill was saying, um, that they are the ones who should have that final decision. And um, in states where there are not laws and regulations that exist right now, um, are there court cases that uh, may have um, that may have been brought around this issue. That is not something actually that we researched. We um, actually should do that. I do know that there is um, a case being brought in one state right now um, where this is being um, considered. And as we get more information about that, we'll be happy to share it. But it's um, at the early stages at this point. Consent is probably the paramount issue that needs to be taken um, into consideration before an electronic monitoring device is put into the room. Certainly, um, the resident, um, should they have capacity to do so, should be the one that provides the consent. Um, and um, any roommate of that resident needs to also provide consent if a camera or other recording device is put into the room. Capacity issues certainly need to be taken into account. And um, most of the laws that we um, reviewed um, provide that the resident's legal representative can provide consent if the resident is unable to do so. <clears throat> How um, the consent is documented needs to be looked at, um, and um, certainly any requirements based on state law need to be followed. Um, if you can get written consent, that is the priority um, so that there is documentation and a record that um, the resident and the roommate or their legal representative also has provided consent. And as Bill said, if um, the resident's roommate refuses to provide consent or puts limitations on that, that needs to be taken um, very seriously and considered. Um, <clears throat> any limitations on the consent should also be put into writing. Um, so that uh, there's clear understanding of what is allowable and what is not allowable. And if the roommate um, fails to provide consent or does not want the recording device in the room, then the resident who wants it um, should ask for um, the opportunity to move to another room um, should a bed become available where they either are in there by themselves or with a roommate who can provide consent or does provide consent to their use. Um, Bill had mentioned talking with residents who had, did not want these devices in their rooms. And we've also, over the last couple of years, um, had some discussions with groups of residents talking about this issue. Most recently, we did this past summer. Um, we also did a couple years ago. Um, all of the residents, obviously, that we were talking to had capacity and could make their own decisions. Um, and all of them talked about um, recognizing um, why people would want 
um, the, to use electronic devices um, and recording devices. Um, each of them said they would not want them for themselves, um, but also recognized particularly why they might be important for residents who were unable to verbally communicate either through not having capacity um, or some other condition and were not able to communicate um, what was going on with them, why it might be important um, for uh, they or their family members to install a recording device um, in their rooms as a means of um, either prevention or protection um, or assuring um, that they were being treated properly. Notification that a device is in use is um, a, an issue that um, each of the state laws addresses and is important. Um, so what considerations that need to be taken into account include what information needs to be shared. Um, is it just that a recording device um, is um, in use or may be in use in the facility, um, in a particular room? Where does that notice need to be placed? Um, for some, the, it's enough that it be at the entrance to the nursing home that a recording device or surveillance camera may be in use. Um, there's been discussion in states about whether um, such a notification actually has to be a, either at the entrance to um, the resident's room where the device is in use or inside of the resident's room. Um, that needs to be um, discussed and looked at in terms of what's required um, in your state, um, what's most um, beneficial for the resident, and um, also uh, looking at who needs to be notified that the uh, recording devices in place, the facility administration, do other residents need to be notified, the staff that are providing care for um, the residents in that particular room, visitors, who needs to be notified that there are recording devices um, in use in that facility and in that residence room. When and how the device will be used is an important consideration. Um, so will the camera recording device be on all the time or um, does the resident or only want the device being used at certain times during the day? Are there particular shifts that they're concerned about? Um, do they want it turned off when personal care is being provided or when certain visitors come into the room? Um, as we had um, talked about earlier, privacy considerations are paramount here. And so, um, you know, there may be instances where the resident does not want communications recorded with their physician, for example, or um, with a particular family member or with an ombudsman. Um, so um, talking about when the devices will be on and off and who makes those decisions and who has the ability and authority to turn those devices on and off needs to be considered prior to the use of those devices. Again, thinking about what are the goals and objectives for installing such a device can help guide that discussion. Um, who's going to install, maintain, and provide upkeep to those devices is, an, is another consideration that we need to be thinking about. Um, who's going to be responsible for the costs associated with it? Most of the states have come down on the fact that the resident or their legal representative that want the device, they are the ones responsible for all of the costs associated with it. Um, and that's certainly not an unreasonable um, thing to um, include, but that is where most of the states, or I think all of the states have actually come down on that. Who has access to the recording? Um, the resident, the legal representative, anybody else that they designate, um, but does the staff have access to it? Does the facility administration have access to it? Um, does that have to be provided by the resident or their representative? We would argue that it does, um, that it would be the property of the resident themselves, but certainly look at um, again, your state law or guidelines around this issue, uh, make sure that you're getting legal advice. How will the recordings be used? Um, that's certainly um, an important consideration as well. Um, are you looking to use them in some further um, action um, or just to have peace of mind or as a preventive tactic? Um, recognize that use of these devices, particularly once the staff that are providing the care know that they're in use, um, may affect the relationship with staff. Um, certainly, um, we want staff to always be providing good quality care, um, being treating individuals with dignity and respect, 
Um, but um, as we have certainly <clears throat> been reading, as we were doing research on this issue, um, staff have a hard time with um, knowing that these devices are monitoring their um, every action and move and conversation um, in a residence room. And so that may raise some issues of distrust or paranoia among the staff, um, as well as uh, among other residents um, or others in the facility. So that needs to just be a recognition and um, uh, recognize that that's, um, that may happen and it needs to be a consideration prior to installing um, device. One thing we really want to emphasize is that cameras are no, not a substitute for personal involvement and care. Um, that um, it's certainly, um, if there are concerns um, about the care that's being provided, their use may be a particular tool in um, assessing what's been happening um, in a particular residence room um, to that particular resident, but they're not the only answer and they're not the end all and be all situation here. Personal involvement of family, of friends, um, monitoring of staff that are well trained, um, having adequate and appropriate numbers of staff in the facility, um, regular oversight of um, the people that are coming and going um, in the facility and the staff that are there. All of those things are important um, and are not um, ameliorated just because there's a camera that's being used in a particular residence room. Um, certainly, I think that um, recognizing that the recording devices are a tool is important. Um, and also, um, the use of a camera, if there are, should not um, be a cause for waiting to address concerns that you have about poor care or abuse or neglect that's happening in, in a particular residence room. If there are concerns about poor care or abuse or neglect, certainly that needs to be addressed immediately and not wait until you get the results of um, the camera recordings after a certain number of days. Um, concerns about poor care, about unexplained bruises, um, about changes in behavior need to be addressed right away with the facility staff and administration, trying to assess what's been happening there, talking to the ombudsman program. Certainly um, residents and families have the opportunity to file complaints with the licensing agency that oversees the, the nursing home, um, and in some states, um, they also have the opportunity to um, seek help from protection and advocacy organizations or adult protective services. Citizen advocacy groups are available in some states to help, and if there are concerns about abuse happening with a resident, law enforcement should be called right away as well. Um, contacting the ombudsman and some of those other resources um, can be done through our website. Um, the Consumer Voice website or the Ombudsman Resource Center website, and you can get access to them there. And um, we, I think, probably have time for just a couple questions. We're really close, I think, to the top of the hour. Um, but um, Alicia, while you're looking at the questions, um, I'll show some resources that are available. And if there are a couple, maybe you can read off one or two. As okay, Alicia's sure. working on this. Questions? Sure. We we do have a fact sheet um, that's available on the website, um, and there's additional information certainly about good care practices, um, rights, dignity, um, getting good care in nursing homes. All of that's available on our website, and additional information is also available on the NCEA website about abuse prevention, um, about providing um, good care as well. So. Um, with that, Alicia, uh, I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. Okay. Um, one of the questions that we received the most is who has access to the recordings, such as um, residents may sometimes date one another, they might engage in intimate acts, and the camera continues rolling. Does everyone have access to the recordings? Do the state surveyors have access? or in the alternative situation where they're using the recordings as evidence, do you have to turn over the recordings to the police or reporters? So um, I think that those are really good questions. I mean, certainly um, look to your state laws if they exist in those handful of states. Um, other than that, there are not specific requirements um, in terms of 
who has access um, to the recordings, which is why it needs to be one of the considerations that needs to be taken into account prior to using those recordings. And um, again, we would just refer folks back to getting legal advice about those. Um, Bill, in your state, um, how, who has access to them? The, the recordings belong to the resident and or their legal representative. The facility and others are not allowed to access them. And if they intercept them or use them in some other manner, then they have actually committed a crime. There are statutes in place that make it a misdemeanor for individuals to tamper with, hamper, or access those uh, recordings without consent of the resident. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. The, and certainly that's an important issue and consideration that needs to be taken into account. That's something that maybe we can do a little bit more research on and um, maybe provide an answer to that question um, after having done that. Um, and we can post it on our uh, webpage. Alicia, maybe one more question? Um, sure. So we got a number of questions for Bill, actually, and about the Oklahoma legislation. And one of the questions was, were residents getting pushback about installing cameras, such as were there legal arguments or policy arguments proposed that residents did not have the right to install a camera when they wanted one in their room? As far as legal arguments, no, there, there really wasn't a lot of opposition from the industry in regards to the statute. They do get pushed back regularly when they're trying to use the cameras now. Um, staff members uh, will try to dissuade families and residents from using cameras and, of course, dissuade the roommates from giving consent. And that's that overt um, obstruction that I was referring to earlier. But there was no legal argument per se that uh, a resident wouldn't have a right to use that, especially since the both our state and our federal laws fortify that residents have a right to retain and use their own personal property. So that camera would be considered a resident's own personal property. Thanks, Bill. I think we are past the top of the hour at this point. So with that, I'd like to say a big thank you to Bill Whited and Julie Shane for um, joining us this afternoon and supporting this webinar, um, particularly um, Julie's group at NCEA who partnered with us um, on this. We will go through the questions and um, look to provide some responses that we can post um, to the website or send out through eBlast to you all. Um, don't forget that the materials from today's webinar are going to be posted on the website along with the recording. And um, we appreciate your interest in this topic. We'll continue um, doing some following of it and share updated information as it becomes available. Um, thanks for joining us this afternoon and have a good rest of the day.